Join us in Omaha, Nebraska on Saturday, October 7th, 2023, as I'm proud to present the most unique and important paranormal event in the United States this year, Historic Haunted Heartland Part 2, The Spirits Speak. Presented alive on stage at the Benson Theater in the heart of Omaha. The fun starts with renowned saxophonist from Colorado, Andrew Vogt, whose talents will help harness the psychical energy of the audience, living and deceased, to open a doorway for communication. Next, psychic medium Cindy Kaza will use her considerable gifts to invite these spirits forward to communicate with the audience in a psychic gallery reading. And finally, Paranormal and occult expert John E. L. Tenney will offer his interpretation of these events and help us all make sense of what we have witnessed as only John Tenney can. Tickets are available this summer, and I invite you to visit Necronomicast.com. Follow the show on social media for more information. Historic Haunted Heartland 2, The Spirits Speak. Brought to you by Necronomicast. Saturday, October 7th, 2023. A night that can change your life or your afterlife. From the historic haunted heartland of Omaha, Nebraska, my name is Brian Corey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all, young and old, to this episode of the world-famous Necronomicast. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome again to the program for a return appearance, paranormal investigator extraordinaire, Adam J. Berry. Of course, you know him from Ghost Hunters and Kindred Spirits, but now he's author Adam Barry as we chat about his soon to be released book, Goodbye, Hello, Processing Grief and Understanding Death Through the Paranormal. Adam has written a thought provoking and remarkable book that will inspire conversations across the land about the shared paranormal experiences that unite us as humans and the implications of life after death. So say goodbye and hello to Adam Barry. And now calling in on the Necronomicast hotline, I am so excited to welcome back to the program from Kindred Spirits, Adam Barry. Adam, my friend, how are you? I'm very good. How are you? Good to see you again. It's great to see you. You know, uh, I don't take opportunities like this to have meaningful conversations for granted. I had you and Amy on, Amy Bruni on, uh, your partner in crime. I had you guys on in... I think last year in anticipation for season six, I think it was, mm -hmm. uh, of Kindred yeah. Spirits. And uh, you guys survived that season. You made it through uh, <laughs> another year of investigation with season seven. And so, uh, but the reason that I got you on the show is your fantastic new book that I was able to read that's coming out soon. Yes. Goodbye, hello. Yes, it's the, uh, one of the, I, I always, I make fun of it because it's goodbye, hello. Processing Grief and Understanding Death Through the Paranormal. So it's like the longest title of any book ever, <laughs> but it tells you it tells you exactly what you're going to get, you know? Processing Grief and Understanding Death Through the Paranormal. And I had to we had to put it that way because if we had just stopped at goodbye hello, people would be like, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> what is, what does it mean? You had me at goodbye. You had me at hello. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Well, when I heard about you working on this book, uh, you know, I follow you on tr on Twitter. I, you know, I watch your shows. I follow a lot of your your uh, compatriots on. You know, I met you at at Kindred Spirits. My wife and I had a great time at Belvoir Winery. So I, I'm I'm a big fan of yours. And when I say that, it's not just because I have stars in my eyes. I really uh, <laughs> I I enjoy like listening to you and your unique perspective on things. And it's not you know you have a television show and that's great and everything. But the way that you go about your investigations and the way that you carry, you know, you carry yourself and you speak about compassion for those that have passed uh, and, and how you treat investigating with integrity, that really resonated because, um, you know, I'm 48 now and my uh, thrill-seeking days are probably somewhat behind me, you know, when it comes to the paranormal, you know? Yeah, I'm not, get it. I'm not running through cemeteries late at night with my with my teenage buddies anymore, but... Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. We have no time for that. We have no time. <laughs> I got to get to bed. You know, I got yeah, to come to me. It's like, ghosts come to me instead of me coming to you. Right. 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 So, <laughs> so, but to have you on the program again and, and to talk about this remarkable book, uh, what, what a treat, man. Thank you. Yeah. It's, um, it's one of those things that I, 
first off, it's the hardest thing I've ever done uh, writing this book. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because you, you know, when you set up to do something as massive as this, but, you know, if you're like me, you have so many thoughts going on in your head all at one time. And so to, to take all of those thoughts and make them cohesive and put them into sentences uh, <laughs> is very difficult. And I think, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, that each topic was well talked about and, you know, researched and I had the right people to talk about those topics. Um, and I, it, the pressure of like leaving something out uh, was pretty intense. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of it. it. It's crazy. Like I have a copy of it right here and it's so crazy to even just like hold it and be like, oh yeah, this thing, you know, like this thing came out of my, out of my, out of my head. Um, uh, but I wanted to do it because I had been thinking about most of these topics for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, when you're thinking about writing a ghost book, you have a bunch of options and I didn't want it to be just scary stories or just a how to, I wanted it to have all of those elements, but I also wanted it to do something for someone. I wanted people to take away lessons or ideas or information that they can use in their own life to better understand grief and what the afterlife might be. For sure. I was, I was struck by a sentence. Uh, I'll quote from your book a couple of times in this chat, but I was struck by a sentence that appears early on. You talk about the humanization of spirits is the only way we can better understand the activity that is happening. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, it's it's one of those things where, you know, uh, you hear a knock or you 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 know see something out of the corner of your eye and, and your house is haunted. It, to me, yeah, that's interesting, right? And people get a thrill from that activity, especially investigators. Are like, oh, I just saw that I did something. You know, like, did you hear that noise? That was in, that was insane. But there is a reason behind the activity, and. Usually, most of the time, it's a it's a it's something that a spirit needs or wants that is based in a human connection. And I and it's hard to explain, but it's like I feel like there are a few things that are universal in spirits. Like just because they die doesn't mean they lose that human interaction, the need for human interaction and connection, right? So they need uh compassion, understanding, conversation, communication, like all of these things that we take for granted because I can see you, right? Like I can't see a ghost. Ghosts are hard to see. They're hard to interact with. And, you know, they may not know. It's, I don't know. It's just like, uh, that. that's the whole vibe. It's the humanization of spirits to better understand the reasons why they are doing the things they're doing and hopefully helping them and giving them some sort of peace and, uh, you know, comfort ending. I don't know, you know? Sure. Now you wrote this book, you know, perspective of like, uh, recognizing and and hopefully dealing with uh, and coming to terms with grief. And we always think of the grief of those that are left behind. And mm. for me, you know, the older I get, maybe it's just because I, you know, I'm, I'm I keep seeing that number tick up every, every October <laughs> that, I, mm-hmm. that I get older. Yeah. Right. But the, uh, compassion that you showed toward those that have passed. You know, all our lives, we're worried about the day that we die. We think about it, you know, someday, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it affects everything that we do. Like if we're going to get in the car and drive, you know, we're always worried about our, our safety or, or things like that. And so to show compassion mm-hmm. for those that have passed, you know, what a horribly scary, isolating, lonely feeling that some spirits uh, must have. And to kind of change you know, from our fear, what we're bringing to it, like a paranormal investigation and, and start to actually kind of put yourself in the shoes of those that have passed. Yeah. The isolation, the loneliness, the sadness, uh, you know, being disconnected mm-hmm. from your loved ones and everything and actually trying to focus like what they could use from you, like, you know, to help them. Yeah. Right. And even if, you know, even those spirits who seem uh, aggressive or cocky, or like they're playful, you know, the, you, you, we all investigate and we get those spirits that you're like, oh, he's just messing with you, or he's just, he's a mischief maker, he's playful, or 
he's grumpy, or maybe maybe he's a jokester, and there and you're like, oh, that ghost is so happy, right? Mm-hmm. We know a lot. Of, we know people that are like that in real life, and there's always something else behind that happiness. There's something else behind that lashing out or that always joking. Like what you're always joking. You seem always so happy, you know, but like, you've got to have down days. Mm -hmm. And I think it's even, even if you're uh, connecting with spirits that are like that, it's looking at the, what else is there? Like we are multi-layered emotional creatures and I don't think that stops once you have passed away. And if you're in spirit form as a ghost, um, I think there's multiple layers. And I think a lot of the times, the first, when we interact with spirits first, you get surface, you get like what they're, sh- what they are showing you just like the person, like what I'm showing you now, like this is one layer of me, but this is all I'm going to give you hmm. because because this is this is the conversation, but there is like lots of other things happening, and I think it's the same way with ghosts. They're going to present themselves, you know, in one way as they want to be seen or uh, as they want to be recognized by you, and it's your job as an investigator to say, okay, that's great, but why why are you here? Like, what else do you need? What else is there going on that we can hopefully help you with? Um, ghost hunting is deep. I mean, it, I mean, it does start for everyone in a, in the same place, which is great. It's just wanting to have experiences, and it, that's totally fine. And if that's and if you've been doing that for twenty years and you're totally cool with just going out and having experiences, by all means, that is totally that's fine. Um, but I love to encourage people, and Amy and I, especially with kindred spirits, it's like we want to encourage people to dig a bit deeper into why they are investigating, like. What else can you get from it? And so this book is a culmination of like what we what we have learned, what I have learned in my in my life, um, what I've experienced that has taught me lessons to help me in my own life, not just uh, not just going out and looking for ghosts and just being like, oh yeah, ghosts are real because I had this experience. It's what else can I get from it? Sure, it's that deepening of the perspective, like. M- when I was in my twenties and I was thinking, or even younger, and I was thinking about, you know, a uh, paranormal phenomenon, I, you know, I pretty much thought like, we're going to a haunted location or something like that. And we're going to go find a ghost. We're going to go see a ghost or talk to a ghost. And that was kind of like, that was the basis of it, or that was the whole mm-hmm. of it. But now as I get older and I kind of think about things more, hopefully more deeply, I'm thinking about, well, why would somebody persist? after their bodily mm-hmm. death. Why? What are they trying mm-hmm. to tell us? Like you said earlier, what did they need? How can we help them? Is there a way that we yep. can help them bring closure, not to pass and move, you know, pass them uh, to another realm or anything like that, but just to have their voices heard. And so many people in life, if you think about it, so many, pe- so many people in life don't get their voices heard when they're alive. So how mm-hmm. frustrating and sad that must be after they pass on that still they're unheard. And the fact that you guys uh, and people that follow you try and, and think about it that way. And to give a voice to those that don't have a voice, I think is a beautiful thing. It's changing the perspective of how we think about what a haunting, uh, and, and what th- this process of grief and, and, and persisting after bodily death is all about. Yeah. I, uh, thank you. I, yeah, it's, I think what's important in this book specifically is the, I guess, you know, for me, I learned a lot. Uh, from talking to these experts and people. And it's it's the hope uh, and the comfort that I feel knowing that, you know, I have spoken with someone who has passed away who is in a ghostly form. They continue, right? They continue. They're they're in a way, they're they're still continuing, right? Even after death. And so for me, it gave me hope. Uh, it gave me comfort. You know, when I think about those that I've loved that have are no longer here in the living form, like it makes me misty eyed, you know, to think that like they, my grandmother could be uh, an arm, like uh, an arm's length away if I just wanted to like say something and, and maybe she can hear me, you know, maybe she's there watching over me. Maybe it's her that like, uh, you know, got my attention. So I, 
would recognize something. You know, it's, um, it, it makes, I don't know. It's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. And it, I think it's flipping the narrative on spooky ghosts. Like, yes, ghosts can be spooky and scary and not knowing what the activity is. But if you just humanize the activity and you think, oh, they're a person, they're a mother, a father, a grandmother, there's somebody that's like me, they just are non-living. Like, it, it's it's a good feeling. It's a, like Martha would say, it's a good thing. <laughs> For sure. For sure. You know, and and I like the fact that you, you you get personal in this book. You talk about, like you said, your personal paranormal experiences. You talk about your grandma. You talk about friends that that you've lost. Uh, You were talking, uh, um, there was a a passage in chapter 12, um, Mm -hmm. people that you know in through the theater community and and the the tragedy of AIDS and and how that decimated, you know, so much of the creative uh, community. Yeah, you know, and and when I was um, starting kind of like my musical career here in Omaha, my real first professional job was at uh, the Omaha Community Playhouse. At 16, I was hired to play in a pit orchestra for 42nd Street, and mm. the people that I met along the way, and just opening my eyes to different types of folks. And you know, at 16, you got your prejudices that you pick mm-hmm. up along the way especially if you live like in the Midwest and if you're, you know, an average looking, <laughs> if you're an average looking white guy like me, you know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, <laughs> so I appreciate the fact that like you and your personal stories, um, your history and, you know, the performing arts, you know, I, I felt like a kindred spirit with you mm. <laughs> with, with this and how personal you do get in this book. Now it's not like your complete biography, but it's so, uh, you, you, you touch on these things and themes and these thematic things in your life that, um, are very relevant, uh, to, to topics of the paranormal. And, and again, mm. that just kind of opens up the door to like the human experience, you know? Yeah. A lot of the, uh, as people are reading the book, uh, I, I'm finding a connection where it a through line and people seem to relate to a lot, a lot of the book, like just parts of the book. They just seem like, you know, Oh, I've thought about that before, or um, that makes so much sense to me. Like I, I never thought of it that way, but it, it's absolutely how I feel or think about certain topics or, um, and I think the, the book is universal uh, in the sense that, again, you know, it's, it's based in human experience. It's based in human nature. Um, but there are ideas and thoughts that, that come out of it, uh, that can maybe give you a different view on like your grief or a different view on religion Mm. or near death experiences or, um, dream visitations, for instance, like that was a, uh, that was a big, uh, a big deal. Uh, I mean, I had, my grandmother came to me in a dream and, you know, it changed the way I felt about her passing. And a lot of people have those experiences. Um, I think even though it's, you know, kind of rare, but I think we don't talk about them because they're so personal and deep. And you're like, is that, was that real? You know? Um, but a lot of people have, have said, you know, I feel like this book is talking to me specifically. Like, I feel like it's written for me, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. When I was uh, reading through your book, I kind of thought back, you know, five, almost five years ago, my mom passed away and she was in her eighties and <clears throat> she had been sick for a while, very strong up to the end. Uh, but when she passed away, it, it came upon me being the only child to kind of pack up the old, the house that I lived in that she lived mm-hmm. in for over 40 years and kind of go through things and then put mm-hmm. it on the market. So I, like, I had, I was grieving the loss of my mom and then going through all these memories and through all the, all her, the stuff in her house and things that were mine and things that, that were hers and trying to make all these decisions. I went through another like grieving process and not in a materialistic mm-hmm. way about the house, but just about that kind of end of the end of the line, end of the road for that part of my life, part of my life, you know, this, this, mm-hmm. um, uh, the safe place that I always went back to my mom's house, went there for Christmas, birthdays and, and, and everything. And I was wondering, you know, I, I thought about this and I even talked to uh, John Tenney, who's quoted heavily in your book about if I being alive 
could haunt my mom's house because of the memories and the sadness and the grieving and everything that I was going through. You know, I was, I was going through before I turned over the keys to the house to the realtor at the end of it, when I cleaned it all up, you know, I was, I was touching the walls and I was opening up the closet door that had the, my favorite squeak and, you know, like just all the yeah. sounds of the house, you know? So yeah, I don't think that just uh, a, a, a dead person dying uh, can haunt, you know, it's that, it's that intention. And you talk a lot about intention in your book as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I, I absolutely know exactly what you're talking about. I mean, that, uh, the hotel room in, at the Hawthorne hotel that we grieved our Chihuahua before we took her to the, uh, you know, the emergency vet, that hotel room is haunted haunted i mean the hotel is haunted by itself um but like that room specifically i can't imagine the next people who stayed in that room had to have been like mm. holy jesus like what is going <laughs> on like they they had to have felt it right and so i think you know i think our emotions and our memories are uh you know that energy stays in these homes that we grow up in and we we leave i mean there's so many memories that uh you just you kind of don't want to forget it's the fear of forgetting the fear of not remembering uh i could you know you are grieving not only you're grieving the loss of your mother but you're you're grieving your childhood mm. you're grieving what will never be again you're making a choice to continue your journey. But in order to continue that journey, you have to grieve what you cannot change. You know, you have to get through that spot. And a lot of people, and not a lot of people, I, I think some people uh, get caught in that, you know, and they, it's hard to move on from that because it's this struggle of like, but I want, that I want those memories. I don't want to forget any of that. You know, I don't want to let go of that because I'm, I'm going to forget. And the thing is, you're not going to forget because it's it's always with you. It pops in your head every once in a while. You're like, oh, you have this memory that comes back to you, and you know, in in that in a sense, they're with you again. You know, they're your mother's with you again. Your father's with you again. It's like they're they're always with you. It's just recognizing that it's okay to continue on and not know what's going to happen. You know, it's, sure. I totally, I try, it's hard to even explain it, what you're, what you're talking about, but I a hundred percent know what you're feeling. And those listening, I'm sure you know what we're saying, talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you get it at home. I'm yeah, sure you do. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, there, another great quote in your book is like, you say, I believe in the power of intention and that people can use their intention to manifest spiritual outcomes. Uh, we're merely yeah. observers to the unknown, documenting our experiences to better understand our own uh, mortality and the hereafter. And yeah, it's important work. Yeah, I think the idea of being strong in your intention of your own spiritual self is important. Like not losing that is important because there's a there's a fine line between you know, wanting to take care of others' spiritual needs, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being nice to people and being nice to ghosts. Like I, as a, as a ghost hunter, as a paranormal investigator, that's my whole thing. It's like, I want to make sure that the dead and the living are lit, are good together and we're t helping each other. Um, but then I can't lose sight of my own, my own spiritual self and my own intentions. And I think having, even if they're small, like I did a, I did a workshop at Michigan Paracon on intentions and manifestation in paranormal investigation. And it's not hard to do. I mean, you, your intention is to set out, like you set your attention intention at the beginning of an investigation, you can, and you manifest the outcome hopefully. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. Not investigating. You get up every day and you say, my intention, my intention is this, or I'm going to, I'm going to have a really good day or whatever it is, you know, you try to start from a positive place <laughs> and you hope it stays that way. And I think people need to do that spiritually, mentally, physically, 
uh, even though it's very hard to do, trust me, it's very hard to do. And sometimes we don't take that time for each other and ourselves. Oh, for sure. Especially ourselves. I mean, I try, I try to get up every morning and I say a little prayer to myself silently. Mm -hmm. Like I've opened my eyes and I'm, I've got another day to try and do some good in the world or not do any harm, but also like just coming from a place of gratitude, just like, thank you to whoever. Mm -hmm. Now I, I, I believe in a higher power. I believe in God. Uh, not everybody mm -hmm. does, but I just think just having that sense of gratitude for what is in front of you that day is, 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 is a powerful intention as well. And, 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 I, yeah. and, and you don't see a lot of um, like that positivity or that hopefulness a lot in, in ghost hunting and I understand that because we all dig Halloween. You know, we all dig October. We all yeah. we all dig graveyards and spooky bats and all that kind of stuff. But when I really sit down and think about it, you know, there's just this gratitude that I have for life. And hopefully, God willing, that when my body shuts down, that my spirit and that same gratitude and thankfulness, that part of me kind of lives on as well. You know, I don't want to mm -hmm. have a... Um, a sadness or a, um, a yeah. regret, you know, I'd, I'd hate to go through uh, centuries of persisting in some house with profound sadness and regret. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the one thing that we learn from the afterlife and those that are, that have passed away is, you know, living your life to the fullest, saying it now, doing it now, not having, Oh, I wish I could have said, I, you know, I wish I had done this. It's like, you know, just do it, try to do it. Uh, even if it's something small, like just try to do it because you might not get a second chance. You know, you might not get a chance to ever say it again. Um, but you know, if I, uh, I think the biggest, uh, I guess the biggest lesson that I took away from the book really is the the faith, the faith, uh, you brought up faith. It's like, you have to have faith in something, something mm -hmm. or nothing. Like it doesn't, if you have faith in nothing, that's faith, right? Like, you know, it's like, it's you, there's something that it's good. It's good. You don't have to, but I think it is good and positive to have faith in something because it keeps you grounded as an individual. Right. Um, and of course we don't know all the answers. I think if we knew all of the answers, uh, we would, there is a lot of people that'd be like, screw this life. If we, if we already know a hundred percent what happens next, like, woo, bye, I don't care. Right. Uh, this world is crap shoot. Right. Yeah. And so I think, I think we don't know all the reason, all the, uh, answers 100% for that reason. I think if we did, it would be a very different world. It would be, Ooh, God. Um, but I think, you know, growing up Southern Baptist, I mean, I grew up Baptist. It's like, you are told that there is one way and then there's another way. There's two options. That's it. And for some people that works, you know, that, that's a, that, that either or a or B option is a, you know, it works for them, but for me, it doesn't like, mm -hmm. I I'm like, okay, but what about C and D? Right. And I think the religion chapter was the biggest thing. I, the, the biggest thing that I learned from like speaking to Matt Arnold, who is, uh, had, you know, a theology professor, like knows ghost hunting and, and paranormal. The fact that he was able to explain to me biblically from the text of the Bible in the original language that was written for the society at the time, where it says, you know, they talk about psychics, they talk about visions, and they talk about uh, go. They literally, there were times that Jesus could have said ghosts don't exist, but he doesn't. Right. He doesn't, which to me blew my mind because there was always like growing up in a church and things that you know, like, you, you break away from certain things and you create your own ideas. But then in the back of your mind, every once in a while, especially late at night, when you're, when you're having sleep panic, you're like, <laughs> did I, get, did I get it wrong? Like, oh. did I get it wrong? Mm. Right. Did I get it wrong? How am I getting it wrong? And I think that chapter for me specifically was like, no, 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 you got it right. You're, you're getting it right. You, you might not know all the answers and, or whatever, but you're okay. Like, it's okay. To, to look for these things and to delve into this kind of situation. Um, uh, so I have no idea where I'm going with this, but I'm just going and I just said that. So go <laughs> next. 
I literally just was like, well, where's I think, my brain going? Uh, right, right, right. Well, this is a good chat. <laughs> what, what I like about your book also, like you're not afraid to bring up uh, religion in a book and you don't, you don't by any means trash uh, religion. Oh uh, no. You talk about your personal um, experience in the Southern Baptist church or in that particular Southern Baptist church. One thing I always think about too is like, you know, I, you know, I'm a Catholic guy, and I realize that there are, has been and continues to be a lot of problematic things about the Catholic Church and all churches. And that's because here on earth, uh, the church is, all churches are populated by, run by, and everything by human beings who are inherently mm -hmm. flawed and have all kinds of different mm, motivations and, and, and things like that. So it, for me, I just have to kind of think about things and surround myself with people and situations uh, that, how do I say this, that don't run contrary to what I think God or the universe would want. Yeah, and, and that's, I agree. That's, 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 that's really heavy, and that's, that's hard to do on planet Earth because human beings— can be wonderful and they can be, you know, it reminds me, it reminds me of this old quote from an Irish pastor that I, that I just absolutely adore. And he said, you know, Brian, sometimes you're dealing with the people of God and sometimes you're dealing with the goddamn people. And, and yeah, <laughs> true. Sure. And true. And like, the thing is, is you, um, what's, what's so interesting to me is like, uh, I talk with Greg and Dana about this, Greg mm -hmm. and Dana Newkirk. And it's like, you know, our version of paranormal investigation right now, paranormal investigation in the Western world, in America, is very Christian. Uh, it's it's heavily Christian. It's heavily uh, Catholic-based Christianity. Um, and it's because of, you know, the last, like, 30 or 40 years of, like, Lorraine Warren and Hans Holzer. And it comes from their experiences, their religion, and we sort of base you know, what we're doing now on, on the pioneers. Right. Right. Um, and it, it's, it's okay. But also you have to realize there are, there are tons of other religions that talk about ghosts and spirits and what do they think and what do they feel? And so you, it is absolutely okay to approach paranormal investigation from a Christian perspective, uh, from, you know, talking about demons and, and saints and prayers, like that's totally fine. Um, but make sure you also do your research about what other people think, mm -hmm. because you will see that they cor they correlate. They, there's like very similar things in everyone's religion that pops up. These stories are almost the same. Like there is the son of God in a number of religions that kind of do the same thing. It's just we are telling this version and, and they're telling the exact same version, but it's over on that side of the world. Right. Right. Um, and it's uh, it, it's fascinating, but the but the overall through line is like ghosts and talking about ghosts and psychics and metaphysical things have have been happening since before written word. Like it's it's been going on ever since humans started existing. You know, whenever that was, when we could have thought and we recognized death. Right, you recognize it's something that's about to happen. Or not about to happen, but like it, it, it's we're a species that is aware of our demise, <laughs> you know. And I think once that happens, you're it's immediately okay. Well, what is death? What what is the ritual? You know, um, what happens? What can we do to continue that journey to the next life, to the next thing? Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested. I don't think anyone's going to burn the book based on the religion chapter. Oh, and no. if they do, listen. If they do, someone please make it go viral so that everyone <laughs> buys the book and then sets them on fire. Like, yeah, you know, what a way to get a bestseller. Go buy 10,000 <laughs> copies of the book and have a big, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have a big bonfire, you sure. know. Right, right, right. Of course. The reference to religion and spirituality is is... is heavy in your book. And I'm glad you didn't shy away from it. And the last thing I'll kind of say about that is the way that I look at the world, the way that I think about life, the way that's my perspective. That's how I've seen it. Mm -hmm. And those are my experiences. I haven't had the mm -hmm. full uh, gamut of human experience in my 48 years here living in Omaha, Nebraska. 
I'm not going to pretend that that's all that's in God's the the or the universe's imagination. Like what Adam Barry has gone through in his life in your X amount of years, what somebody right. else has gone through in their life a hundred years ago, and, and what's going on now in a different country. I am not going to uh, base something as heavy as what happens in the afterlife based on my mere mortal experience. Well, I think it's, I think it's important to also, it's like you share your thoughts and feelings and ideas Mm -hmm. on the paranormal and the afterlife with those that you respect and trust. And you like, I'm going to have a conversation with you and, you're going to share ideas and we're going to learn from each other. And I think that's what was important for me about this book was I didn't want to say this is the way it is 100% because nobody knows that. Sure. And I also didn't want to, I didn't want to tell people how they should be grieving. Like I, that's not, that's not for anyone to say like everybody's grief is very different from everyone else. Um, so this isn't a how to grieve book, you know, mm-hmm. uh, it is a, it is a, here are my experiences here are all of these other people's experiences. Where's the commonality? Where's the common threads? And take from it what you will to better process your own mortality and grief and your thoughts on death and the afterlife. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think it's very important that we all make sure that we're sharing ideas and we're not saying that our ideas are the end all be all because it's not true. I mean, it isn't true at all. Yeah, that's what's what's brilliant about your book is that it, it's a conversation starter for sure, and not just a starter. Mm-hmm. I mean, you it it really lays out some real great uh, talking points or some uh, bullet points of discussion for people too. I think uh, one thing that I knew it was going to be a different kind of book uh, than than your typical kind of paranormal case study. I knew it was going to be different when I started reading, and you were talking about how you were at a convention and a woman came up to you. And she had questions about ghost hunting, but it wasn't from the standpoint of how do I communicate with ghosts in a house? It's how, when I pass, because I'm ill, when I pass, how can I communicate with those that I've left behind? And you talk yeah. about that. And that, that I've had that kind of conversation, not about ghosts, but like, like I've talked to people that are terminally ill and they're coming to, to terms with their illness and their own mortality. And, and those kind of conversations will bring you to your knees for sure. Yeah, it, it was an eye-opening experience. I mean, that happened, that probably happened in, no, that happened in 2010 mm. at the at the Otisaga Hotel. Uh, it was a an event, one of my first, uh, you know, and we had just finished uh, talking about ghost hunters, right? We were like scariest places, best cases, doing a and a with an entire group of people. And I don't know why she chose me. Uh, you know, I was the newbie, right? I was the guy who just started the show and I was, she comes up to me and I'm thinking, you know, she's going to be like, oh, a question I didn't get to ask. Like, what's your scariest experience or how'd you get into this? Um, and she says, you know, I am, term- I, I have only been given a couple of weeks to live. Hmm. How do I contact my family after I pass? And I, I was shocked at first and I'm, you know, and I'm trying to be compassionate clearly. I, and there's, I don't know the answer. Cause no, I mean, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't know if there, we, there is an answer. And I did my best to like support her feelings and also like support her, the energy that she's giving out. Cause it was so calm. It was so peaceful. I was like, this is wild. Um, you know, and I, 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 the last thing I said to her was, um, you know, if you find out, will you come back and let me know? And she was like, of course. Hmm. Um, and you know, I've obviously I've never heard from her ever again, like living or, or deceased. I, I don't know what happened to her. Um, I, I did go back to the hotel room and like break down in tears because it was the realization that what we are doing isn't while it is fun, while it is great that we could go out and like encounter these spirits and have these experiences. It's very addicting. We want to, we want to experience the the things. What's on the other side of that knock? What is on the other side of that? And like, just, it was a lot to take in for someone who had just sort of been thrust into this 
te- quote unquote television world of ghost hunting. You know, it was a it was a eye opener. But at that moment, uh, sort of stuck stayed with me forever in the back of my mind through all these years later and everything that we do. And it was one of the things I thought of first when uh, I was like, you know, if I were to write a book, what would it be about? Uh, and you know. It, uh, I think there's little moments in our life that stick with us, whether we know it or not, that culminate to bigger things. And I think this book is a culmination of a lot of different little things. Changing the perspective uh, of, yeah. of things. Um, there was a, another part of the book where you were talking about a former client or somebody that you and Amy helped uh, on Kindred Spirits, uh, a lady named Missy from Kansas. And, and, it's a great passage talking about changing the perspective of living in a haunted house. She was very scared at first. And then when she learned more about the the past residents and going back to the humanization of spirits, she ends up now being like protective of them. Like, yeah. like I forget the people's names who, who owned the house before her, but she's just like, like talking out loud. Uh, should I do hardwood floors or laminate floors? Yeah. You know, like having that. Yeah. Yeah, it was Missy. Missy, she. Uh, it was actually, I think it's New York, New York State, upstate oh, New York. But she, that's all right. Kansas, you know, it's the same. Where it's like Dorothy in New York. Um, <laughs> yeah, they're a lot. Of, they're a lot alike, Adam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. Um, but they, <laughs> but she, yeah, it was Stefan and Amelia, mm. I think. And they, her. What was interesting about her is she was so terrified. A, she had been plagued by this rumor that you know, somebody had committed the act of suicide in her attic and that image stuck with her. Oh. And, and now I, it's so funny because now she is Catholic, right? Mm-hmm. Her mother is Catholic. They come, they approach it from a Catholic standpoint, obviously. Um, but now it is true that she will take a piece of equipment and she would go to her son's room, I think. And she sat on the floor and put the equipment out and said, do you want laminate floors? Or do you want hardwood floors in here? And it would like go off on hardwood floors. And she's like, okay, hardwood floors, right? Right. Um, and it's it's one of those things where you're almost living with an invisible roommate. Uh, and she has accepted them as family. She treats them as family. She doesn't let people investigate the house because she respects their space and she doesn't want them to be messed with. Um, but in a way that helps her coexist with the activity that still occurs, right? Like she still has things that happen. I get an email or a note every once in a while about it. And, you know, she's like, it's so crazy this happened or, but it's no longer like I'm terrified of this. It's you won't believe what happened. It's so unbelievable, right? It's a, it's a, it's a awe inspiring event rather than a event that's going to ruin my life forever. Um, yeah. And it's why we do what we do. Like, uh, again, if you're out there par- doing paranormal investigation and somebody asks you to come to their house and investigate ghosts, like you are messing with someone's life. Like you are going in, please be respectful. Please know that whatever comes out of your mouth is going to affect them very much. So you can't lie to them, but you can't, and you can't sugarcoat, but you can't, you got to be very careful about what you do because at the end of the day, you get to go home and they are stay, they're staying in their own house. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's, it's knowing from a human perspective that you are speaking to humans and you're helping people that are living. And you're also speaking to those non-living who are humans and you're trying to help them. It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I heard you and Amy gave a lecture at Belvoir Winery. And one thing I think, I think it was Amy that said like, when you're investigating or she's going, when you guys are going into a location for the first time, especially if it's somebody's home, you don't walk into somebody's home and act like an a-hole for, right. you know what I mean? So you go in there right. and you show proper respect, like, please and thank you. How may I, you know, can I help you? Is there something I can do yeah. for you? And, and, I, and I think that's just a great, um, it, it's changed a lot of how I think about the paranormal because especially, you know, like, like I talked about earlier, like losing a parent. Um, you know, like my dad died when I was 15. I lack a real adult perspective of what, what my dad was to me growing up because I was just a kid, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, with my mom, I had another 30 years with her. The, the humanization, I'm going to come just keep bringing that up. If there's any kind of, uh, thematic element to this episode of Necronomicast, it's just the humanization of spirits. And, and you mentioned the new Kirks earlier and they, Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if they came up with this or, but it's attributed to them a lot, their whole concept of curiosity over fear, I think is super Mm -hmm. powerful. And and 
when I approach the paranormal and life after death, I'm trying to uh, have a real sense of curiosity of why things happen and 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 what what in my life is affecting things like that spirituality like, yeah you know, it's it's super it's super interesting it's it's so much more complex than just well, somebody's died and their their ghost is here it's much it's um it's much deeper you know it's much deeper than i think we realize and it's again if you're listening and you don't want to go that deep it's totally fine it's a scary topic it's a scary thing to think about because once you once you start humanizing your spirits and your ghosts and you start thinking of them as, you know, once living now dead, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy topic, right? Because you're thinking about, I mean, as a paranormal investor, we think about death all the time. Uh, writing this book was heavy. It was tough. It was tough because it's talking about death all the time. And it's like, you know, um, sometimes you have to take a break and, uh, and, and go at your own pace and your own speed. But yes, curiosity over fear will always win the day. Mm -hmm. I got a couple more things I wanted to kind of bring sure. up with you. Um, now I've got this, um, we're recording this here in mid September. It's going to come out in a couple of days, September 15th, this episode. And I, uh, in the next month, the next month I got this big event uh, happening in Omaha with Cindy Kaza and John Tenney and my friend, a musician, Andrew Vogt. And we're going to do a, a musical psychical uh, experiment and interaction to try and open the doors psychically for Cindy to walk through and bring spirits forward. And then John to tell us what the hell we just saw. Right. And so yeah. you're, you have a lot of stage experience and I love musicals. I have 25 years of playing in pit orchestras uh, for all kinds of um, musicals and things like that. And I found a quote or you're talking in your book here. Um, <laughs> Is it the Sondheim quote I snuck in? <laughs> I don't know. Was there a Sondheim quote in there? Yeah. There was a Sondheim quote I stuck in. There's like little Easter eggs that I put in there that maybe people will, maybe people will get. Beautiful. Well, like as a performer, as, as a guy that, you know, it, it, being on stage is old hat for you. Uh, on stage, you write, on stage, there's a moment when you are so energetically connected to the material and the audience that you completely disappear into the universe. It's like when you had that haunted honey when you're talking about with the New Kirk yeah. that episode of Kind of Spirits. You become one with everything and everyone. There's an exchange of energy from the audience to those on stage and back. It flows like a giant current and moves, with, uh, moves some to tears and goosebumps. And so it, it goes on and on. But just that whole uh, connection... Uh, because I believe, you know, deep down these paranormal experiences that we have, they're human experiences. We're, we're mm -hmm. communicating psychically, telepathically, sometimes physically with something that we can't discern what's in front of us or around us. And so much, I, I just keep bringing up these, um, uh, these thoughts of mine of like performing on stage, interacting with an audience, uh, having a, mm -hmm. somebody on stage performing uh, a, a 30 year old musical, something like, um, ragtime and me crying, you know, somebody's mm -hmm. powerful emotions. You know, I, I just think like you can, you can see paranormal outside of paranormal being outside of normal experiences, connecting, mm -hmm. connecting humans in that way. And I see it so much from the performing arts. Yeah. I, I strongly believe that's, you know, it's, it's why human beings love entertainment in that way like i'm not talking about watching a movie at your house i'm talking about even watching a even watching a movie with a bunch of people at a theater similar can mm -hmm. work it, it's similar but it's not the same um live theater and performance is so energetically connected to again the human experience and it's the action and reaction of what's happening on stage, the audience taking it in and giving it back to the actors on stage or the musicians or in a concert. And it's very powerful. I mean, those that are that have been on stage and even in the pit, like you can feel it. It is this weird, bizarre, energetic thing that happens that you sort of want to live in forever. Like you don't want to forget the moment. It's like forgetting your old house you lived in. It's like grieving. You don't want to forget it. You mm -hmm. want to hold on to it. And you have, as an audience member, I've like, you know, I've seen so many shows. I've probably seen the same show uh, multiple times and I'm still going to 
have that same reaction because it's the chord structure and it's the harmonics and it's the moment and it's the, it's what I'm getting from it. It's, um, it's feeling, it's feeling. It is something that shows you, you are alive. Yeah. You are li- You are living, right? You are alive. And I think that is very important. I also think that's why a lot of theaters are haunted. I mean, oh, it's sure. like yeah. th- these spirits feed off that energy. They're like, oh, this energy is here. Like, of course I'd want to be there. Mm-hmm. Of course I'd want to have that experience. Um, well, and they feed uh, the audience too. I mean, like yeah, those it's, performers it's, feed the audience what they need. Yeah, and I, I think it it is... Uh, it's refreshing. It doesn't have to be a musical either. It can be a play. It can be a concert. Mm-hmm. It could be, I mean, it could be a, a tribute band. Like, <laughs> as long as it connects with your human ex- experience and yourself, you know, those moments are really wonderful to achieve because it's, it shows that you are alive. Like uh, you're here. Yeah. And so that's why I think like these human experiences and the paranormal, they all go hand in hand. And I see it even, Mm -hmm. I see it more and more with uh, like, like the performing arts um, being an interactive, connective human experience that we can all share together. You know, like some guy on stage, you know, two hours ago, he was mowing his grass and he gets on stage, puts on his costume. He's rehearsed. He, he knows the lines. He knows the song. He connects with the piano player. And I'll be damned if he can't make you cry sitting mm-hmm. there on stage, you know, because the, like you said, the chord structure, um, the phrasing that he does, just how he emotes on stage or she emotes on stage connects with you. And I, and I just, yeah. I see so many, you know, connections there with, with like yeah. with paranormal because i just i feel like you know if you're in a, in a haunted location there are things that aren't physical but they're still so human that we, we're connected to right yeah i i see it as like i i see it as this like as an actor like because i grew up you know being in theater and like doing shows like you sort of drop into your, this character that you're playing you drop into their experiences you get to be someone else. You get to pretend to be someone else you know, for just a moment, right? And you, it, it's, it, there's a feeling to it. And then when you investigate, I encourage people to do that same thing. Like, don't lose yourself, but sort of drop in to the moment and what's happening and breathe and take that in and ask your questions from that dropped in almost meditative space. Because you'd be surprised at the answers and or the questions that you want to ask come naturally. Mm-hmm. And I think that energy that you give off is received by those spirits. They can feel it. And in turn, they want to give it back to you. Um, so I think uh, uh, I, I, it's, it's the same. It's, it's about dropping into a place that's deeper than your surface self and coming at it from that perspective and not rushing it and not worrying about it just and, and letting it happen naturally. It's, uh, it's, it's very similar to being on stage for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just, uh, just as I, for the further I go through life, uh, I just, I, I feel that. And, you know, and I, I've, I've played some, some really, some really big gigs. I'm not going to sit here and brag about them, but, but I just know that there's, <laughs> There's been times when I take a breath and I start playing my trumpet and I've got a lot of, you know, preparation. I've memorized something where I've worked the technical stuff out with my fingers and breathing and stuff like that. Like all that's gone. But then there's sometimes there's times when I'm performing and I just am like lost in it and I'm in Mm -hmm. the moment. But it's like you said, you just kind of drop, you drop in and something Mm -hmm. else kind of takes over. And I, and I, I still Mm -hmm. think that there's something that whatever is allowing me to for, for, to, to give up control and, and let some kind of musical intuitive thought process continue. It's gotta be something maybe in the same part of my brain that might end up haunting this house in 50 years. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I totally get it. I get it. It's It's uh, It's a weird thing. Yeah. 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 You don't have to be an actor or be on stage to experience this either. You, you know, it's, it's something that everyone can achieve in their own way. They just need to 
tap into it and oh, find it. If you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you can go to a you can go to like a musical show or some kind of something like that and sit in an audience and, and be totally immersed oh, yeah. in it the same way. Oh, for sure. For sure. And in the audience, you know, you're you're receiving that that psychical energy, communication, mm-hmm. humanist, you know, I mean, whatever you want to call it. It's a journey. It's an experience. Did you know you uh, were writing such a heavy book when you were doing it? I mean, this is a deep book. Uh, did I know? I mean, probably. That's why I was pulling my hair out most of the time. There were days, it's, what's interesting when I say it's like the hardest thing I've ever done. It's true. Mm-hmm. Like there were days, like I would go three or four days and not write a word because I was like, I don't know what else is in this brain. Like I need to say more about this topic, but I don't know what that is. And so it took me, you know, it would take me a couple of days to like unlock a new thought Mm. because you, you can't force it. It's like, they have, you know, it has to be from me and it has to be. So it's like, I review my notes again and I think about conversations and I, um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think the more I'm talking to people like, you know, you specifically and like other people, like it is, it's much, I think it's much bigger than I had anticipated it's a much bigger thing than I guess I expected it to be, but then we never really expect anything. You just sort of put it out there and see what happens. And I am, I mean, I'm very excited for people to read this book. If you, if you love ghosts and you love the paranormal, you're going to love this book. And if you don't like paranormal investigation and you don't believe in ghosts and don't care about ghosts, you will also love this book. Like there's something in it for everyone, I think. No, and that's that's totally true. I can see it both ways. Uh, like if you are a a total uh, believer in the paranormal, and you watch all the TV shows, and you read all the books, and you and investigate all these theories, and, and you know, and you know your history, there's a lot in this book for that person. And if you're mm-hmm. a skeptic, or you don't understand all these concepts, and you have your doubts about things, there's a lot in this book for you to, like we said earlier, change yeah. your perspective. You know, and I, yeah. And I, and and I I I just um <clears throat> it's you know when you got a when you got a podcast and you uh, invite you know writers and and experts in the field and and I've got a I'm very so happy and so proud of like if you look through my guest gallery like the different guests I've had over the years and because like I don't know you know I'm not a real like I'd say expert on anything but having these <laughs> conversations with people who are deep thinkers, who put out these um, creative works, who, who who have sat down and worked hard to flesh out their ideas and their perspectives uh, onto the, onto the printed page. You know, it, it, it gives me, um, it, it gives me so much joy to be able to, you know, pick the, pick somebody's brain and, and get, thank you, you. Know, th- get these, uh, these jewels of information from them. So, and, and to have you on the show twice, my gosh! I don't, what? I, I must. Be, That's crazy. I must be living <laughs> living the good life or something. So yeah, I'll see you. You know, I'll see you again the next book. I'll see you again the next book. <laughs> Is there going to be a next book? You, you got plans? I, I'm. I have. I have some uh, ideas and thoughts floating around. Something actually specifically uh, with theater oh, cool. and the paranormal. Oh wow! So Fantastic. I I wanted to do something a, maybe a little bit more light. Uh, but, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a few different ideas, so there'll be something else, but first and foremost, this book, get this book first. Oh, so absolutely. there can be other books. <laughs> absolutely. And I'm very appreciative that you sent me the, uh, the, the preview e-copy because, you know, I read through it and I was highlighting things and all these quotes that really resonated with me, but I need to, just like all of my listeners need to get a physical copy of this book or ebook or the audio book. I know you were recording one uh, mm-hmm. I, I saw on Twitter. If you're a fan of this stuff, if you're a skeptic, if you're on the fence, if you want just a good book about the human condition and, and, and the human perspective on different kinds of things, I would highly recommend this book and place it on your shelf right next to Amy Bruni's book, right next to John Tenney's book, right next to... Uh, Let's see what else do I got over there? <laughs> any, <laughs> exactly. any, any book by Richard Estep, any book by you know Jeff Belanger, like. But Adam, congratulations on a fantastic first book. It, it's it's thank you. It has so much insight into it. I don't want to be like uh, like a backhanded compliment, like for your first book, it's got. But really, it's remarkable. 
what what an accomplishment that and uh, you got to be so proud you and ben and you and your your lovely mom that i met at uh at uh belvoir everybody's yeah. just got to be so proud of you thank you i appreciate it. thank you for having me and uh We'll do it again sometime. Absolutely, my friend. Everybody, I've had the pleasure of having the great Adam Barry, author of the new book, Goodbye, Hello, which is available at booksellers everywhere on this episode of Necronomicons. Well, there we go, everybody. The great Adam Barry, episode 257, talking about his fantastic book, Goodbye, Hello, Processing Grief and Understanding Death Through the Paranormal. You know, like I said to Adam, I wasn't blowing smoke. So many people would love to have Adam on the show, and I've had him on twice, so I don't know. As Hulk Hogan used to say, say your prayers, eat your vitamins. There you go, brother. Hey, big news on the Necronomicast front. If you follow me on Facebook or Twitter or on Instagram, you probably already heard the news. I've teased it in the past, but here it is. The television debut of Necronomicast on the A&E Network, starting at the end of September. September 29th, to be exact. A new series entitled Murder in the 21st will make its debut. I will be on episodes that air on Friday, October 13th, and on Friday, November 17th. More details to come, but if you don't follow me already on social media or the show, I invite you to do so. And keep your eyes glued to many more things coming your way from Necronomicast headquarters. Thanks for everything, everybody. Really appreciate your love and support, the kind messages. <sighs> That's it. This guy's got to go to bed. Everybody have a great night, a great life. We'll be back in a couple weeks with wonderful October programming. Take care, everybody. <laughs>